Hello, my name is Brian Fisher and welcome to our latest uh, podcast from the Hoops and Dreams uh, production team. Uh, in this close season episode, I am joined by James, the creator of the Hoops and Dreams Forum, and Dave, who is our superb editor on these podcasts. So welcome to you both. Thanks, man. Yeah, good. Just to make sure that they're really live. Um, it's been an interesting close season so far. Firstly, uh, the new season starts earlier than usual uh, to accommodate the World Cup in Qatar. Uh, secondly, as our new head coach, Michael Beale, sifts through his squad, rather like Gollum in Lord of the Rings, looking for his precious. And thirdly, seeing the departure of Device, uh, Moses Odebayo, uh, Don Ball and Johan Barbe, to name some. Um, on the plus side, we've heard that Albert Adoma is staying and we now have uh, Kenneth Powell at left back and Jake Clark Salter uh, at centre back. So it's, it is some good news in amongst all this. So, of course, we should talk about the player movements, um, but I also intend to ask my guests about the following topics later on. Should the EFL introduce a 60 minute limit? Uh, then we're going to go on to talk about rail seating uh, in the R block and those promoted and those relegated to the championship, those clubs that uh, we now face in the new season. And what changes can we expect from Michael Beale's favoured style of play uh, to Mark Warburton's? Uh, and lastly, five subs. We're going to have five subs next season. So how are we going to get on with this? How will it all work out? So let's stick with player movements for now. Uh, and my first question to James, are you happy with the players coming in so far? Yes, I am. We do need more, obviously, as we'll probably discuss. But um, Clark Salter seems like, on paper, a very good sign. He's got championship experience. Um, he's obviously coming from Chelsea. He's been on their books till 24. And I used to think that was a good thing because I was thinking, well, why did Chelsea have someone till 24 if he's not good enough for them? But... They do it with everybody. So there's always that question mark, isn't there? Is he actually very good or not? Coventry fans, though, seemed um, disappointed that they missed out on him. So that's potentially a good sign. In some ways, I still think, why didn't we just keep Barbe, who was a leader and knew the club and was effectively the same player? I mean, this guy might be cheaper, but we don't know. Pal, um, on paper, he seems exactly what we need. Pacey, energetic fullback but he doesn't know the English game, does he? So again, that's his question mark. Is he going to settle in? Hopefully he's going to be one of those guys where when they're doing the Sky matches, they're analysing how amazing he's been and how he's doing X amount of crosses and his coverage and stuff. But we don't know. That's all we can hope. Um, but with Pal, I feel we know, I feel we need another left-back. I don't think he can be the only one because we've got Hammerline and that no one seems to trust. Um, so even though they... The, the good signings on paper, we obviously need to see them play, but we need more reinforcements in a few areas still, don't we? More of the same, yeah. Okay, and Dave? Yeah, I agree with what James said, really. I mean, Powell sounds good on paper. All the stuff they've said about him is how good he is attacking and let's get crosses in and all that. So I haven't heard much about if he can defend yet. So I'm hoping he can. He might be another one, similar to Manning, that was great going forward, but didn't really fancy defending. But... Well, you know, well, I haven't seen him, so I can't really comment what he's like. But he sounds good. And the same with Clark Salt, really. Um, kind of similar to what they did when they signed Barbe. He seemed a similar sort of player. Got him on a free in his mid-20s. So hopefully it goes as well as it did with Barbe. But like James, I still think, I don't know why we didn't just keep what we had, to be honest. And unless, he was, unless his wage demands were massive, which I can't imagine they were, I don't really see why we didn't keep hold of him. Um, plus, he can play left back as well, Barbe. But I don't want to go on about someone who's gone. To. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Obviously, we need. We, sorry, go on. I was going to say the only thing that I would say, perhaps, uh, uh, in this regard, is that perhaps both of them are faster than the uh, people they're replacing. We yeah, need pace. Well, yeah, we definitely need pace. And obviously, we need more to be added to the squad. But it's still very early, and it? it's only uh, mid June as we're recording this. Um, they're going to need some forwards. A right back, and he's just say some more backup players. So I'm, I'm sure more will be coming in soon. Yeah, I, I, I'll be honest. I, I've been looking every day, wondering uh, when they're coming in, and uh, it does seem that we're leaving this quite late. You know, we'll be into the warm-up matches before they've turned up. I think. 
But there was an interesting thing I saw with Michael Bill the other day talking about um, how a lot of Premier League clubs are going to take their young players with them on tour and they won't be back until the championship season's kicked off. So a lot of the loans that you probably want to make might not be till late in the window this time. So I wonder if like some of the, I think they're going to want to loan forward, but it might be quite late that they come in. Well, I just have to hope they slot in. Um, mm. I mean, Dave, do, do you have any misgivings about losing Barbe, Device, Adebayo and, and Dombo? Yeah, because you kind of, well, we know how good they are and they're kind of reliable players. So it's always a worry when they go and it's like, well, who's going to replace them? But th the key thing is how they replace them. Um, if, if they can get better players in or if they have a similar standard and maybe on less money, you know, it'll be great. But yeah, until they bring those in, it's, it's, it's hard to know. With Ball, I can understand it a little bit. It was a shame where I'd like to see him stay, but we do have a lot of central midfield players. Yeah. So I, I can kind of see why they did that. But I would again, I would like to see him stay. Uh, James, same? Yeah, I mean, especially with Barbie. I mean, we're banging the same drum here, aren't we, all the time? But <laughs> to me, if you've got someone at the club who literally bleeds for the cause, you just keep them. They're, they're, they're the players you want. You, we're just saying now, we've got new guys and they might be better, but there's, we just don't know. And you had someone who you knew was going to do a certain job for you at this level. and So he's the biggest one for me. Um, Odebajo, I might have actually kept. He was up and down, wasn't he? But because we're looking so weak at right and left back at the moment in terms of cover and stuff, he could do both. So potentially we maybe should have kept him, but again, it was injuries. Same with device, isn't it? I've said before, he was a monster of a defender, but yeah. he could only yeah. ever do two games and then he'd be out injured. So I can see why they got rid of him. Um, Don Ball, I would have kept mainly just for how he could cover. But as a few people have put on the forum, he, he probably wanted to leave because he doesn't probably want to be a cover player. He can be a first team starter for someone else, don't Carney. So you can understand what that one is. It's mainly Barbie, isn't it? That we all seem to um, yeah. be questioning. He wanted to stay. He was exactly kind of what we need. <laughs> so it's just a, just a very strange one. He hasn't got a club yet, has he? I don't think. He hasn't gone anywhere, has he? I don't know. People kept saying he was going to Bordeaux, but they, they've been relegated, uh, yeah. some kind of punishment relegation or something, haven't they? I don't know what's going on. That's rather sad for him because he could have been going home. Oh, well. Um, yeah, the, the only other thing I would mention that the two of you haven't really covered is the fact that we're constantly being told that QPR is in transition. Um, but every time you go around uh, sort of uh, lopping limbs off left, right and centre, uh, it's not really a transition. It, it, it's much more of a sort of a root and branch change you're, you're, you're going through every single damn season. Um, that, that's my only concern. Other than that... Um, We'll have to suck it and see, won't we, I think. Um, OK, so on to the first real topic. Should the EFL introduce a 60-minute limit? Um, this stems from a, a football-wide discussion that was held uh, and an interesting article, too, on BBC. Um, does football need a 60-minute stop clock? Um, the ball is in actual play uh, for an average of 55 minutes in a PL match. Uh, and I believe in uh, the championship for 53 minutes only. So it's 53 minutes of every 90 minutes uh, are actually active uh, with the ball. Uh, the concept uh, being discussed is whether games should continue until 60 minutes has finally been achieved um, and, and then stop the game. So it could go on for quite some time if you've got teams that are perhaps, shall we say, uh, liberal with their time wasting. Um, the advantages... It's easy enough to bring in and implement, is it? I, I'm, I, actually, I'd question that now I'm thinking about it. Uh, we'd actually get more action and it would hopefully bring in uh, an end to the gamesmanship, blighting the game. Uh, I still think any players would go down in the last five minutes to kill a, a momentum. Um, but at least the other team know that they would still have five minutes playtime guaranteed. Disadvantages, uh, I suppose the negative would be when the clock only shows 10 seconds and you have a goal kick, could the whistle then go just as the ball is flicked through to a striker on a one-to-one -one or a scenario like that, where somebody is about to score and time runs out? Uh, maybe the rule would have to be a, where the game ends when the ball next goes out of play after the half-time, full-time whistle. Um, and yet more policing of the game. This is a huge disadvantage as far as I'm concerned. Um, 
the game is going to be policed much more. It's probably going to end up with uh, being another stick that the fourth official is going to be beaten with. Um, so I have my misgivings about this. James? I think it is something that needs to be looked at, and I would probably be in favour of it. Um, but they need to just trial it, don't they? They maybe need to trial it in the in the League Cup or, or the FA Cup or something like that and see how it goes. Um, I think it would work. But like you said yourself, you're still going to get teams that they'll go down just to at least dis- to disrupt the play, won't they, to get, stop the momentum of a team. But one of my main gripes is when they'll say, five minutes added time, someone goes down for two minutes and then they only play like an extra 30 seconds. That, Especially when you're losing, it's 2-1 and you're trying to get back. That is an absolute killer. It always winds me up. So... If it would stop something like that, then it would be good. But I do agree. At what point do they then end it? That is always a question mark for me. Do they? Because if they say it's the next time the ball goes out of play, you're gonna it's gonna be like rugby league or something where the team are just trying to knock it out of play just so the final is looking go. Um, I, I don't know. It, it, I think it's something that could work. There's probably a few little issues, but it's something they need to look at because when you say 53 minutes and it's, it's I think it's lower in some other leagues as well. That can't be right, can it? It just cannot be right. Dave. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised it's as much as 53 minutes in play. It feels, it feels less when you're at the games, to be honest. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see it, to see how it works. Um, see, you know, like you say, how, how it would work at the final whistle, whether you just keep playing like in rugby until it goes out. But um, really, I just think they should just implement the rules they've already got. There's <laughs> things in place for time race. They've got a rule on goalkeepers can only hold the ball for six seconds. It's never, they never do anything about it. So if they could just put the... You actually implement the rules they've already got. That would, I think, would have a bit of an impact on things. But there's, yeah. there's, they never play with good people for time wasting. It's just, you know, if, if players can get away with it, they're going to get, they're going to push in, push in, you know. Everyone does it. They're like, we, we do it. So. I t- I, yeah, we've started doing it and I don't think you like it. But yeah, I, you're absolutely right. I, I think there are more proactive ways of achieving this um, through better refereeing, to be quite honest with you, uh, more effective refereeing. Um, we know that some teams are blatant on this. I mean, some teams have even got well known for it. Um, so rather than uh, amend the rules, I, I really do feel that uh, we should be looking at uh, strict enforcement of, of um, when a situation occurs. For example, you force people to, um, to go back the three metres. If they don't go back quickly, uh, then that's it. You know, uh, they've got to move back from the ball. And, um, you know, if they don't, then see yellow card. Uh, and it's, it's going it's it's, it's, it's to take, it's, it's take a referee to send a goalkeeper off, isn't it? As soon as that happens, even one game, all of them will hear about it and stop it. They go up to them on the fit, even when they do it early, 55 minutes, right, yellow card. And then yeah. 10 minutes later, the referee will go up to them and like, no more. He's like this to them, or aren't they? No more. And they go up to them and like, tell them off. And like, there's still half an hour left. You and they just said that, yeah. Yeah, blow the whistle, or like, come on. And it's like, well, until you go up and actually send one of them off at some point, and it sends a message to the managers, because the managers would then have to speak to the team and say that you can't do that next match because you're going to get sent off. One game just needs to have that happen, and it probably will eradicate a lot of the issue. On Goalkeepers going from one side to the other with the goal kicks as well. Get rid of that. Go, just take the goal kick on the side it went out. There's little things, like you said, that you could, uh, they can either trial it or just get strict on the rules that are there, like Dave said. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> well, let's let's see if it comes in. I mean, it, it was an interesting discussion. It, it really surprised me when it came up. Um, let's see what happens with this one. And if they did do it during the cup matches, bear in mind that um, if we ended up going for 60 minutes of playtime in, in the FA Cup and then it went into extra time and then it went into penalties, people would probably have beards by the time they got home, you know. Uh, well, certainly the men. Um, right. So a week when they never finish a game, will they? <laughs> So on to, on to our next topic, uh, the rail seating. I mean, they're getting this uh, into the Loftus Road end in the R block. Um, we, I think we've had a concerted campaign going on about this for quite some time. So, um, Dave, is this the right step? I think it is. I think the initial plan they come forward with a couple of months ago was balmy, where they were going to charge you to use the bar and they were going to have... Half the lower loft, but not the not the half next to the singing bit was going to be standing. None of it made sense, but what they've done now seems a bit more sensible. The R block all stand anyway, so what <laughs> else in there? It, it just seems so sensible. And like to try out in the lower loft, try half of it. Um, 
to, like the bid towards the R blocks and see, see how it works. Just give it a season, see how it works. Then you can maybe extend it the following season if it's worked or, or change it if it hasn't. What do you think, James? Good idea? Yeah, definitely. It's something they've got to do because as someone who only goes to Loftus Road infrequently, I find it a nightmare. <laughs> I know people think it's like it's got soul and I agree. And it, when it's dark at night and we're winning and the ground's humming, it's brilliant. That's perfect what it's for. But Lee Hoos always goes on about they don't have enough casual repeat fans. It's diehard fans who will go and sit in that ground happily week after week like us. You're not going to get someone who'll just think, oh, I'll go and watch QPR because if they've been once, they're not going to go again. And maybe the rail seating will help with the club with that, where people think, well, at least I, could, I know I'm going to be able to stand up for the match and lean on the rail or whatever. So it's it's definitely something that I can actually see quite comfortably. And the next year, there'll be another couple of thousand seats added with it as well. They might even end up doing the whole of the uh, Stan Bowles stand. I was about to say Ellersley Road, then, but it'll be Stan Bowles stand. And it may be even they'll do the whole of that. Yeah, Dave, do you think that, that they could introduce it uh, into uh, bigger areas? To see yeah, a bit of success? I, I think eventually they will. I think it will will go well, but a lot of it will be to do with how they sell the tickets. So, like currently, I'm in the lower loft, and to get a ticket, you have to have a, a kid, a child under eighteen, in your party. Now, I assume they're not going to do that with the rail seating bit, otherwise there'll be no one in there. It'll just be empty. So that takes nine months to get a kid. Yeah, they're going to have to relax that. I think if they do, I mean, you see like a lot of midweek games. There's loads of empty seats in the lower loft because people aren't bringing their kids on a Wednesday night or whenever. Um, if they if they got rid of that rule, and you could probably have a lot more people getting in there. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 for me, I, I think it's a, a worthwhile experiment. Um, yeah, it, it may it may introduce a different uh, type of fan. I don't know. Um, but as you say, the <laughs> the loft end is always uh, fairly uh, raucous anyway, and it's uh, there is a fair amount of standing already. It's almost a fait accompli, but... Yeah, I, I'm going to wish it well. I hope it really does does succeed, uh, succeed and expands. You know. Okay. Yeah, I'll draw well, that as well, right? Uh, slightly, it is related to it. We're slightly off topic a little bit. But why do the, we have the away fans behind the goal as well? And I know Lee Hughes' thing is talked about something before why it has to be there. But when we go to like somewhere like Blackpool, we're in like a temporary kind of like stand, and it's along the side, and it's got obstructed views. Why don't we have the away fans in the? far end of Ellsley Road and then the, the school end could then be where they implemented this couldn't it in the lower end of that um I, that's always confusing me I think he said something once about police after they have to be in the school end for police or the way the fans come out or something but it just to me it's, it's, about, about, it's about how the fans come out the um exits but they could if, if there was a will to do it they could work out a way to get people out of Ellsley Road on that side There'd be a, there must be a way to do it. Well, like I say, you go you go to like some League One, League Two grounds. It, it's just crazy. Fans is almost like right next to each other, and they all leave together. Why at our ground is it such a strange thing to say? Why can't the away fans go in that part? And then obviously the school ends all unobstructed views as well. <laughs> so it would probably maybe even sell more tickets if that was a home end. I yeah. I don't know, just strange. I think this is one that we probably should be addressing to uh, Lee Hoos because for sure in the new stadium, when we have one, if we have one, um, that's something we would want to think very seriously about, isn't it? Uh, where we're going to locate the away fans. It, it makes a lot of sense. And I think the idea of having uh, rail seating uh, at the school end, I can see that being great fun for families. I really can. Oh, OK, we'll leave that one for now. Um, we're going to go on to those promoted and those relegated uh, to the championship. Um, so trying to look at the six new teams that we're seeing, although they're not really that uh, new, some of them. Um, we've got the departure of uh, Fulham, Bournemouth and Forest to the Premier League. And instead, we now have Norwich, Watford and Burnley replacing them. Um, whilst Norwich and Watford have almost been regular visitors from the PL, it's been six years since Burnley uh, have been entertained. Um, and at the other end of the championship, we've lost Barnsley, Derby and Peterborough. And they've been replaced by Wigan, Rotherham and Sunderland. So uh, will the three teams that have been relegated, so that's, um, uh, so that's, uh, where are we? That's uh, Norwich, Watford and Burnley. Um, will they be able to use their PL money and PL skills retain those to bounce straight back uh, or do we 
perhaps expect them to change their their sides to make them more championship friendly ha uh -huh. um, and to change some of their personnel to uh, protect their wage bill uh, James well the worst one is Norwich isn't it because you're pretty much guaranteed they're going to be in the top two I don't ever the season when they come down you're always thinking oh man because <laughs> they're not going to struggle if they're outside the top six then just quote me on it it's fine whatever I, I'm wrong but you, I'd almost say they're going to be first isn't that funny stat that they haven't played Fulham for about eight years because every season one goes up and one goes down and one goes down. Um, so Norwich, they've got a great squad for this level. They're the ones I would fear the most. Watford, I didn't even think they were that good when they went up two years ago and they still finished second. And I think they'll be a little bit like Bournemouth last year where they're never actually that amazing, but they still are going to be very much at the sharp end. Yeah, um, it's Burnley, isn't it, where the question mark, but uh, it's more off the pitch than on the pitch. On the pitch, they're going to be horrible to play, aren't they? Uh, they're just going to be physical, hard. They're made for this division. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're the one who you'd think might be not quite up there, but that's only with the off the pitch issues. They've got like a big fine or loan payment, haven't they, that they've got to sort out and things. Um, but it looks tough on paper, doesn't it? But then again, last year did, and Sheffield United struggled to begin with, but then they came back. So, I don't know. It's, it's always hard now, isn't it? Very, very good. It's more difficult. It looks every year. OK. Dave? Yeah, I think like James said, you'd expect Norwich to be top two, top three again. They, they're made for the championship. They're just hopeless when they go up, and they? Watford and Burnley, I'm not sure about. I mean, you'd think they'll probably be in the top six. You kind of always think that with the relegated teams, but... Like James said, I wasn't that impressed with Watford last time they come down, and I don't think they're as strong this time. I think they've lost quite a few of their players since then. So it'll be interesting to see how they do. Burnley's a real unknown, really. They've got a new manager. You don't know if they're going to change their style. They're going to lose a lot of players by the sound of it. So I think with the three, they're probably the ones you'd expect to struggle the most. Struggle, but I mean, probably only mid-table rather than going up. But um, yeah, you'd, like I say, you'd expect Norwich to do well. Yeah, I, I totally with you on that. I think the comments are very valid. Um, the, the championship is often cited as the uh, as the toughest league around. Um, so, how do you think that Wigan, Rotherham, and Sunderland are going to cope, Dave? Um, I think Rotherham will struggle. They're like the opposite, a bit like Norwich, and they they come up to our league and struggle, and then they walk the one below. Um, so, I think they'll struggle again. I think Wigan will probably be around mid table. They were a bit unlucky last time to get relegated when they they had the introduction right at the end, didn't they? And uh, Sunderland's a bit of an unknown. I, I was quite impressed by them last season when they played us in the cup. They've got a good manager. I, I don't know what they've done with signing players, but I thought they looked good in the playoffs. So I think they might do might be a bit of a surprise this year. They could do well. And they've got a massive fan base, haven't they? So it's yeah. interesting to see how they do. Um, James? Out of three, I think they're the strongest, Sunderland. <laughs> there you, James? You think so? Yeah, my, my notes on this were exactly the same. I've literally put well, they're, they're the Norwich between the Championship and League One, aren't they? Um, and Sunderland, I'd expect them to be comfortable. Probably like Blackpool last season, where um, where they, they're not probably going to be trouble in the top six, but you're, they're never going to be, I don't think, in, in trouble. And it's because it's a horrible away trip, isn't it, for a lot of teams, especially midweek, with more midweek matches this year. Um, Wigan, they've got a good young manager, but they probably have got a League One squad. It's whether they're going to be able to add to it enough. Um, I think Rotherham and, and Wigan are going to be down there. Um, and there's no derby this year, is there? So it is going to be a bit of a more of an equal fight this year between the teams. Um, yeah. And you've got Sunderland as well. That uh, you know, As David said, uh, they were playing good football uh, last season. So I, if they carry on like that, I think they'll be, they'll be hard to beat. So going to be an interesting uh, season, I think, this one. Very interesting. Uh, OK, on to our next topic. Um, what changes can we expect from Michael Beale's favoured style of play? Um, we've obviously seen the way that Mark Warburton set up the team. Uh, he's been very positive in the way he, he he's based his uh, football, very much possession-based. Um, so can we expect anything different from Michael Beale? I mean, there's been loads of talk about what sort of formation he'll, he'll set up with as his preferred option. Um, Dave, any ideas? Yeah, I think formation-wise, I think he'll change. I think he'll probably be a back four. It's, um, I think he's talked a lot about playing a 4-3-3, three, three, maybe with um, Chair and Willock behind the striker. 
I think style wise, I don't think it'd be hugely different to Warburton. I think that's why they brought him in. It's going to be a similar sort of style of football, um, trying to play attacking football on the front foot, um, playing out from the back, that kind of stuff. Um, they've obviously brought the full back in, um, Powell, who's going to be like an attacking one, similar to what they've had before. Wallace was quite an attacking fullback last year. So I don't think, yeah, style wise, I don't think it'd be hugely different to what we saw last year. Hopefully, we'll just the results will be better near the end. James? Yeah, I mean, as we're talking now, the squad, apart from, like Dave said, Pal, the starting eleven is probably going to be very similar players to last year, so you, it's not going to be that different. You're still going to have those little triangles between Chair and Willock, and that's what they'll try and uh, build the team around, won't they? Um, he said, though, hasn't he, that he watched all 20, the last 20 matches of last season, um, which is basically a form of torture for the poor guy, but um, <laughs> I'm sure he's watched them because he wants oh, to see yeah, what, yeah. Yeah, what he can change and things, so... I keep thinking he's like the most meticulous manager that we could have possibly got in. He sounds like, he, I think he's, got, he's sleeping with data in his head and stuff like that. He, he, and it sounds amazing. Um, I just, like I say, style of play, I don't think it's going to be that different. Um, I think he wants to play four at the back. I think he was being quite polite in some of the interviews, saying, oh yeah, we might do five. But from everything I've seen, he, he wants to probably do four at the back. But that in itself is interesting because then that means you're going to have either Dickey, Dunn or Clark Salter on the bench. Um, so there's good competition there if he does go for that. Um, we just have to see what he does in the pre-season friendlies. And um, the big question mark at the moment that we haven't touched on yet is the strikers, isn't it? Because Dykes, he's what one what is he scored in one match since October or something. Vaughn, he did think he did the same at Ipswich at a good start and hasn't scored there in many months when he when he's coming back. We're all kind of like thinking, please let Sim play or Armstrong be the next Didier Drogba, <laughs> we're putting a lot of pressure on him. Um, in some ways, I hope the club give him a good run out in even just 45 minutes in one of the friendlies so that we've all at least seen him and can stop this thing where we're all putting all this hype on him when we've never even seen the poor lad play. Um, at least I can go, yeah, he's all right. He's a decent player. Let him have his time. At the moment, it seems to be like, get him starting the first match. He's the answer to everything. Um, yeah, that, that's the big question mark that I've got is the strikers because... We need major reinforcement. Yeah, we do. We do. I mean, I, I fully accept what you're saying there. Um, the, as, as far as, as that goes, um, we'll, we'll forget the strikers for now. I think probably if he's going to carry on with the possession based, he's going to try, I think, uh, and push the, uh, the backs up quickly and back quickly. So they are going to be end to end playing. And he's already said that Sam Field will be doing exactly the same thing. He wants him to be an end-to-end -end player, uh, which is asking a fair bit as well, you know, to have him uh, doing that. So I think we're, we're, what we're looking at here is high energy. Um, and it rather makes me a wee bit concerned because I know he's done this at Aston Villa and I know he's done it at Rangers. Um, but... I'm worried that the, the training regime to, to get to this level of fitness is going to be such that we're going to end up with perhaps uh, so many injuries as the season progresses uh, that we perhaps need a, a huge depth of squad you know, in quality to, to make sure that we actually get there. I mean, that's my only concern, to be quite honest with you. Um, I want us to be attacking. I want us to, do, um, to be exciting to watch. Of course I do. But uh, I don't want to see players going off left, right and centre for, for niggles. OK. Our final discussion in this list is over something that was rather quietly introduced. Five subs uh, being allowed this season. Uh, this one snuck in uh, very, very quietly, but it must have been agreed with the clubs. I mean, and it couldn't have been done surely without their, their voting for it. Um, so they're going to allow five substitutions and they'll be permitted in three separate occasions, plus half time. Uh, your thoughts on this, James? Just favours the, the stronger squads in the league. I, I'm not in favour of it at all for, for that for that reason, because it does favour the big clubs at every level. But also because I, li I like the idea that the manager has to be a bit careful and a bit tactical with his decisions. Um, they had to think about what they were doing. They couldn't just make rash decisions and then change it five minutes later. They had to think about what they were doing. Whereas now it's going to be like, oh, we're 2-0 down, just throw three strikers on and then we've got another two subs in a minute. It, that, that reason I don't like it. Um, but I had a look in last season, Fulham, at the end of the season, I had a bench that was Hector, Cabano, Shalabar, Carvalho, Brian and Seri. So they would have probably got in most other teams 
for her team, they'll be able to bring five of those six on if they were in this league next this season. Like, and that's just an example, but um, that's not a, a fair playing field because if they if you're one nil up against them and they're then going to bring all five of them on, I don't like it at all. Um, I thought three has worked perfectly for what 30, 40 years. I don't understand the need to overhaul that really. I understood it in the COVID year when we had to come back for those nine matches in three weeks or whatever it was. It made sense over the course of the season. That's why you have 25-man squads to rotate your players that you trust. And I just don't like it on a match-to-match basis having that many changes. Dave, I think you're going to say the same. Yeah, similar. it makes them feel like pre-season games, doesn't it? But they make so many changes. Um and it just makes it so open to more time wasting. We mentioned that before. You just be making extra, so you know, just hold if you want, they like hold a few subs back, make a few during injury time. And they do already making like one or two, but if they've got five, they can make. Blimey, they're gonna, you know, they're really gonna be running the clock down. Um, I mean, the only positive I can think of is it might give some young players a chance. You could, you know, maybe be more inclined to give a youngster twenty minutes here and there if you've got extra subs and you, you've got. More senior ones you could bring on, but yeah, I agree with James. I'd prefer it as it is, really. Yeah, I, I'm, with, I'm with you both on this. I mean, for me, it weakens the teams that have got uh, a lack of depth and of uh, quality uh, and skills in, in their numbers. Um, and for that reason alone, I'm surprised that it was agreed by the majority of the clubs. Um, the only benefit uh, is one that applies to all the, all the clubs. Um, if a player develops a twinge uh, or takes a knock, then you've got the cover to, to bring somebody else on. Almost well, certainly you'll have somebody within that bench that you can bring on who can replace them. And it will prevent long ter- longer term injuries. But of course, if you're bringing on somebody who is uh, much better quality than the uh, the opposition's got on their bench, well, it, it's, not a, it's not a level playing field. It certainly isn't. It, it shouldn't increase the time wasting because they've got to make them in three lots still. So you'd have to bring on two and a two and a one or a three and a one. It's not five separate things, but it's still that element where I think they'll probably have some stats on it at the end of the season. But you'll find that teams who are winning won't make five changes and the teams who are losing will make five changes in the games because they'll just throw everything at it, won't they? You'll have, they're allowed to name as it, in the Premier League nine subs. You'll see teams with five strikers on the bench, won't they? Because exactly. yeah. they'll just be like, oh, if we're one nil down with 80 minutes, we're going to shove four of you on to try and get something. And that's the element I don't like. It should be nuanced and okay. If I if I make a sub at half time, I've only got two in the second half, and to just be able to change half your team. Because don't forget, it is half the team because sub the goalie's not going to get changed often. Although we say that we did that last year a lot, didn't we? Um, but you're changing half your outfield team. I, like you say, it's like a friendly. I, I really, really am against that. I, I don't like it at all. I think uh, it, has, it has got one added benefit, I think, uh, that uh, teams like QPR that have so much new problems with their uh, goalies, we can have probably three goalies uh, on the sub bench. Yeah, uh, first match of the season, Michael Beale will be sending a message to the owners. I've got three goalies on my bench. I need yeah. more players. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, so... That was our final topic, but before we sort of uh, go, I was going to uh, go through our matches that are coming up. Uh, on the 9th of July uh, at 3 p.m., we're playing at Crawley. We're playing the Red Devils um, in a first of our pre-season friendlies. And then uh, on the 13th of July, when we travelled to Germany, we're playing FSV Zwickau, Zwickau, I think, something like that. Um, Uh, at uh, 5 p.m. our time, I believe. And uh, on the 16th of July, uh, we're playing Halshasha. Halshasha? Halshasha. Halshasha. God, you can tell I'm very good with names. Um, And uh, that's uh, a 1 p.m. kickoff by the looks. Uh, And then finally at uh, Grosvenor Vale, we're playing uh, Wealdston on the 20th of July at 7.45. That's an evening kickoff, obviously. Um, Midweek job. So that's four games. Um, well done to all of those who are going to Germany uh, and even those who are going to the pre-season friendlies in the UK. I think it's pretty fantastic. Um, good luck to you. And uh, we've got the season coming up now. And uh, first season game is Blackburn. Any thoughts, lads? Quick one. Go on, Dave. Go on. Well, it's the worst away game possible for travelling. 
<laughs> it's all right for you, James. I've actually it's not too yeah. Well for you. But um, yeah, it's not the greatest of starts, is it? No. Not an easy game either. And I know that Dave's going to now give stats. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, sorry, James. I mean. Oh, the start. Oh, yeah, we haven't won there since 1999. And last manager, we've had what eight different managers have been there and failed to win. Um, but I've, a few Jim Jams and a few people on the forum changed my opinion because they were saying, well, Beale's got nothing to lose, has he? Because we always get beat there. So if we lose 1 0, people go, okay. Whereas if we'd started at Rotherham at home or something and then we only drew even, people would be like, oh, what have we done straight away, wouldn't they? So. In a way, it's kind of a decent fixture for himself because if he can win, everyone's going to be very, very happy straight away, aren't they? Um, he's, he's probably got a first match where he can even afford to draw and everyone will be happy. So he, he, I, I changed my opinion. I think it's actually not a bad match for us to got out of the hat because um, even if we lose, it's not going to mean the manager gets criticised straight away because we always lose. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK. But it's, I love this positive spin. I hope you. I hope you're right. Uh, I think it's a very tough first one, but anyway. Um, okay, before I go, I should mention that at this point that we are about to embark upon our second season only of uh, the QPR podcast on the Hoops and Dreams Forum. Um, and we've learned a lot along the way. Um, so we are listening and we are moving to a new format for this next season's uh, podcast. Instead of reviewing and predicting up to a month's matches at a time, uh, we'll be looking at more frequent uh, podcasts. And as a result, they'll be shorter, hopefully more bite-sized for everybody. Um, we hope you like the new fat format even more. Uh, and we hope that you show your support by subscribing on the YouTube channel. That subscribe button's also ever so important to us folks. Um, and come and join us on the Hoops and Dreams uh, forum. Register on there and, uh, and make your comments felt. Uh, it only remains for me to thank you for watching and to thank my two guests, Dave and, Dave and James. Thank you very much for being here as ever. I'm Brian Fisher and this was a Hoops and Dreams QPR podcast. Come on you ours. We know who we are. You know who we are. We are QPR.